So the idea behind Welch's method for estimating the power spectrum is to take the available data, split it up into segments, compute a periodogram from each segment, and then average the results. And the motivation for doing this is to reduce the variance that is associated with the periodogram estimate of the power spectrum. Recall that the variance of the periodogram is proportional to the square of the value of the spectrum itself. So as the number of data points increases, the variance doesn't decrease. And in this approach, we can take advantage of averaging independent estimates to reduce the variance. So the example I'm going to use involves estimating the power spectrum with the pwelch command in MATLAB. And we'll generate data using a linear time invariant system where we pass white noise through this system to obtain data x of n that we wish to estimate the power spectrum for. Now since the white noise we're going to assume has unit variance, then the power spectrum at the output of the system is just given by the magnitude squared of the frequency response of the system. Or if we express this in units of hertz, we're just going to have again the magnitude response uh, squared with the frequency normalized by the sampling frequency. So I designed a system H using FIRPM in MATLAB to have the following power spectrum. In other words, this is the magnitude squared of H of F. And you can see I did a number of different features. I have fairly large dynamic range in that the largest amplitude to the smallest amplitude spans 50 dB, although in this region here between the two large amplitude portions of the spectrum, we have over 80 dB of dynamic range. And then I have some sections that are relatively constant, and then these two peaks are close together and will give us an idea of resolution. Can I distinguish these two peaks? So I chose this particular power spectrum to illustrate both the resolution and the dynamic range that's associated with different choices for the windows in P. Welch and the amount of averaging that is used. Now P. Welch in MATLAB calculates spectral density. So to get the power spectrum, we're going to multiply the results of P. Welch by the sampling frequency divided by 2. And it's a sampling frequency divided by 2 in this case because I've used P. Welch to calculate the one-sided power spectrum, or the one-sided spectral density, that is. And that's just a normalization issue. So we're going to start off with 1,024 available samples. We'll assume our sampling frequency is 100 hertz, hence in our true power spectrum we're going from 0 to 50. The amplitude will be in units of watts, although we're going to display that in dB. We'll have length L for the segments that we use in P Welch, and R will be the offset between successive segments. So the amount of overlap between segments is given by L minus R. So when L is equal to R, the segments don't overlap at all. So we're going to begin by looking at the Hamming window, and we'll assume there's no overlap, and we'll just try to look at the effect of averaging on the variance of the spectrum estimates. So here we have a case where I basically used a periodogram because I set L equal to 1024 which is the length of the data segment. So that gives me one value or one spectrum to average. In other words there's no averaging. And you can see the variance and it's uh, quite large. It's quite noisy. These are three different random examples that I chose and each of them has comparable variance. Well here's when we take our 1024 points and we divide it up into four segments of 256 samples each and you can see that by averaging the periodograms associated with each of these length 256 point segments we get a significant reduction in the variance and so we've got a much higher quality estimate in terms of variance here. If we take this further and we divide it up into 16 segments of length 64 each, we can see even a further decrease in variance, particularly 
if you look at some of these flat regions here, you see very little variance for the average of the 16 segments that Welch's method obtains, whereas you have quite a bit more variance in the periodogram and um, even more in averaging of four. So by averaging more segments, we get a significant reduction in the variance. Now what's also happened here is my ability to distinguish these two peaks has been lost because I've got shorter segments now and thence the main lobe of my Hamming window is much wider and it can no longer see the details associated with these two peaks. And we'll see that a little more carefully when we look at the asymptotic or the mean value of these spectrum estimates. Now I want to look at the effect of overlapping successive segments when we compute the periodogram. And so again, we have 1,024 data points total, and we're going to use length L equal 256 segments for each of these. And then we'll look at different levels of overlap. And again, this is the default Hamming window that P. Welch uses. So here's the result we had when there was no overlap. In other words, R, the offset between the segments, was also 256. And we had a total of K equals four segments from our available 1,024 points of data. And it's the result that we looked on the previous slide. When we go to R equals 192, now in this case, we have an overlap of 64 points for each segment. Now, because the Hamming window is decreasing toward the end and increasing toward the beginning, there's those 64-point overlap is relatively, that data is de-emphasized, okay, because of the window, and consequently, there's not a great loss of independence between the spectrum estimates, and you can see a slight reduction. Now, here we have five segments when we do it this way. So there's just a slight reduction in variance that's apparent between these two cases. If I use a lot of overlap, so here R is equal to 48, so that means there's 208 samples of overlap between successive segments, and that gives us a total of 17 segments. Well, we're not getting the kind of variance reduction that you would expect if you have an overlap of for 17 segments. Okay, we looked at the previous example where we had 17 non, 16 non-overlapping segments and the variance reduction was substantial. You couldn't see any hardly any variability in these flat portions of the spectrum. On the other hand, we're retaining the desired higher resolution associated with the L equals 256 case. Now, there might be a slight increase in or decrease in the variance between the k equals 5 and the k equals 17 case, but it's certainly not proportional to the number of segments because in this case there's so much overlap that we're really not averaging independent segments of data anymore. The segments that we're averaging are highly dependent. I want to conclude with looking at the bias effects. So far we've looked at variance and how the averaging affects the variance. I want to look at some bias effects in this final slide, and we're going to use both a Hamming window and a rectangular window. We're going to have 500 estimates that we'll average, and that's what we'll use to get our mean. It's actually an estimated mean, uh, and we'll have no overlap. So we're going to look at bias, which is two components to it. There's a resolution which is defined by the main lobe width of the window. We had CWW in the previous lecture was convolved with the true power spectrum. So that's smoothing the true power spectrum by the main lobe width. And then the side lobe heights are what limit our ability to see dynamic range. So here I have uh, the periodogram. In other words, no averaging whatsoever. And I've taken 1,024 points. So because we're using the full length of data, I would expect that this result has the highest, re the high, the least amount of bias. In other words, the highest resolution and perhaps the best dynamic range. And what you can see is the difference in the top here. We're using a Hamming window, which has much lower side lobes than the rectangular window and the rectangular window is shown in the bottom. So the dynamic range of the rectangular window is limited by the side lobes. 
these large amplitude components at plus 20 dB cast shadows in both directions that are given proportional to the height of the side lobes. So I really can't see how low the true spectrum goes in this region. Whereas the Hamming window has side lobes on the order of minus 43 dB. And you can see that indeed the dynamic range is approximately 40 dB here. We can clearly see the difference between this level and the peaks, which is a 40 dB difference. With this lowest level here in the spectrum, we have a 50 dB difference in dynamic range. And we can't see that adjacent to the peak where the side lobes are only down 43 dB, but as we get further away, the side lobes roll off and eventually we can capture that lower amplitude component. They never roll off far enough with the periodogram to capture that. Now the periodogram, I'm sorry, I meant with the rectangular window. Now the rectangular window should have higher resolution. And um, indeed, if one looks really close, you might be able to see that it tracks these peaks a little better and it might track this edge a little better. But the dominant effect in this L equal 1024 case is the dynamic range. Well, here's L equals 256. And in this case, you can see that, again, we have much better dynamic range with the Hamming window. So remember, this, this estimate here averaged four periodograms, each of length 256. So there was a reduction in variance of approximately a factor four relative to the L equals 1024 case. But we incur an additional bias because our ability to represent the fine details in the spectrum is somewhat lost. You can see that we've lost some resolution in that these peaks here are starting to take the shape of the main lobe of the Hamming window and not so not track the truth ex as well as they did when L was equal to 1024. And so again, another place where we've lost resolution, the window ends up smoothing things is near this edge. You can see a slight increase in resolution if you look carefully for the rectangular window because its main lobe width is half as wide as that for the Hamming window. But again, we have dynamic range issues. We can't see the weaker portions of the spectrum with the rectangular window. And of course, this problem gets worse as we go to even shorter segment lengths to get more averaging. Remember when we had L equals 64, we were averaging 16 periodograms and we had a very significant reduction in the variance, but this is accompanied by a fairly severe bias. In this case, we can no longer see these two components in the power spectrum at all. They get blurred together by the main lobe of the Hamming window. And again, we get uh, about uh, 40 or so dB of dynamic range out of the Hamming window as well. And this edge on the right hand side here is also blurred. So we'd have, in this case, we have the best variance properties, but we have significant bias both in terms of the resolution and the dynamic range. On the far left, we had the best bias properties, both in terms of resolution and dynamic range, but we have the worst variance performance. And in the middle is a compromise between the two. So given a fixed amount of data, when one uses a method like Welch's method, you're forced to compromise between bias and variance but if you understand how these properties trade off, you can hopefully make a good choice for your particular application.